Это ее покойный отец. Да, я капитан Александр Грант. Будете еще в наших краях, милости просим ко мне. Все наладится, образуется, так что незачем зря тревожиться. Все безумные образуются, все итоги непременно подытожатся. Были громы, глад, были бедствия. Будут тишь глад и благоденствия. Ах, благоденствие! Все наладится, образуется, виноватые станут судьями. Что забудется, кто забудется, сказки сказками, будни буднями. Все наладится, образуется, никаких тревог не останется, и покуда не наказуется, безнаказанно и мирно будем стариться. У лошади была грудная жаба, но лошадь, как известно, не овца. И лошадь на парады выезжала, И маршалу про жабу не словца. Гремит оркестр, пара-па-пам, Играет марш, пара-па-пам, Ах, как прекрасен праздник наш! А маршал бедный мучился от рака, Но тоже на парады выезжал. Он мучился от рака, но, однако, Он лошади об этом не сказал. Гремит оркестр, пара па пам Играет марш, пара па пам Ах, как прекрасен праздник наш! Нам этот факт — великая эпоха, Воспеть велела в песнях и в Тихах, хоть ложь-то давным-давно издохла, А маршала сгноили в соловках. Гремит оркестр, пара па пам Играет марш, пара па пам А век готовит новый фарш. Я вот все время поражаюсь. Вот у вас нет чувства страха? Я вам задавала эти дурацкие вопросы, когда снимала кино все время. Помните, там тоже было чувство страха. Ну, да. вы, же, вы, вы на войне, это же... Как вас туда вообще занесло? Как, какие... Совершенно случайно. Боже мой, я не военный журналист, я гражданский человек, я боюсь вообще всего, что стреляет. Это очень редкий кадр. Они в Чечне. Журналисты, которые пишут для газет, обычно остаются за кадром. Ой. Ко мне в одном селе подходит женщина. Очень строго мне говорит. Я мать сына которого замочили в сортире. Она не по слухам писала. Она должна была поехать, поговорить с теми людьми сама, вот как бы там тяжело не было. Кто-то бомбит живые города, закапывают ямы живых людей, кто-то похищает людей. И Аня, конечно, для многих представляла опасность, опасность разоблачения. Я видела настолько их много, мужских слез вот за эту войну, что я уже сама не плачу. Я никогда не плачу. Все равно уже существует дозированное э, право на, на получение и э, распространение информации. Самоцензура действует четко. В большинстве изданий даже не берутся писать об этих чеченских проблемах. Да? Потому что знают, что после этого последует окрик и масса неприятностей. Если еще в начале войны какие-то газеты как бы трепыхались, то сейчас, извини, 
этого уже нет. Поэтому назвать это существование свободы слова в соответствии с Конституцией, это у нас же есть все в Конституции, уже нельзя. Я абсолютно в этом уверена. Сейчас какое-то такое, на мой взгляд, неосоветское время. В принципе, советское по идеологии. Существует уже линия партии, так сказать, а все то же самое, которой надо придерживаться. В ходу враг народа, антисоветчик, вот это уже как-то все это говорится. Но на новом экономическом витке, когда есть частная собственность, когда есть богатые люди, но идеология возвращается к тому времени, при котором я сама работала, это середина 80-х годов. Shot in the back four times, just before midnight Moscow time. Boris Nemtsov was walking with a woman on a bridge close to the Kremlin. A witness says a car stopped and several people shot him. Nemtsov, 55, was a prominent opposition leader. Russia. In politics, more than 20 years, rising to deputy premier in Boris Yeltsin's government and considered a possible successor. More recently, Nemtsov had founded the People's Freedom Party and was mounting a large opposition rally this Sunday in Moscow. Tonight, President Putin condemned the killing, but many will believe this was the work of assassins close to the government. Nemtsov was a sharp thorn in Putin's side, telling CBC in 2013 corruption in the Olympics was rife. The Sochi Olympic Games is the biggest fraud in Putin's time. The biggest. Putin, clown, etc. Charismatic, I agree. His fight with President Putin covered a decade, a traveling abroad, to including to Canada, to voice opposition. In 2011, shut out of running in the elections, he said Putin stole them. Putin stole about 13 million votes. Just a week ago, at a rally supporting the Kremlin, a picture of Nemtsov was held high, saying he helped organize Ukraine's uprising. Nemtsov himself told a Russian journalist he feared Putin would kill him because he opposed the war in Ukraine. In one of his last interviews, he said, three years ago, we were in opposition, now we're just dissidents. We have to rebuild. Now, Nemtsov joins a list of dead Russians who opposed their government. Я понимаю, что офицер госбезопасности не должен ни интервью давать, ни выступать по телевидению. Но сейчас, сейчас я понимаю, что наступает момент, когда, в принципе, я за свою жизнь никогда не боялся, не боюсь. Если бы я боялся за свою жизнь, я бы не делал то, чем я сейчас занимаюсь. Я боюсь за жизнь своей жены, своего ребенка. Мало того, я понимаю, что даже если они расправятся со мной, с моей женой, с моим ребенком, они не остановятся. Если этих людей сейчас не остановить, то этот беспредел захлестнет вообще страну полностью. Это будет страшнее, чем 37-й год. Я его расцениваю, в принципе, как распоряжение. Пусть шла одна задача, вторая, а потом вот эти. Тебе необходимо, значит, быть готовым или готовиться убить Березовского. Убить. Готов ли ты? Да, готов ли ты? А потом он сидел с столом, потом встал вот так, подошел ко мне, вот так, ну, ты должен убить Березовского. Вот так, ты должен. Готов ли ты убить? А потом Это вот при ты... свидетелях? Да, в присутствии трех офицеров. И почему... Мы там да. Если что, то Борис Березовский – герой олигархического бизнеса России времен 90-х. Одно время, наверное, самый богатый человек России. Считал даже, что управляет страной. Искусственный устроитель всевозможных схем. Непревзойденный мастер политических интриг. Очень энергичен. На рубеже веков, когда конструкция власти в России стала меняться, Березовский себя в ней как-то не нашел. Борис Абрамович эмигрировал в Лондон. И весь букет своих талантов, всю мощь своих финансовых возможностей пустил на подрывную деятельность и устроение революции. 
в России с этим у него складывалось не очень. Это мое и, отношение него следовало, к вам, Из него понимаете? следовало, что да. вы, как депутат Государственной Думы, даже не посмотрели дело. Вы не знаете даже приговор, о чем там говорится. Вы совершили преступление, вы меня клеветали через прессу, вы написали, что я торговал секретами. Посмотрите приговор, а, и да. там есть хоть где-нибудь. Какие планы я разгласил? Я предупредил о том, что готовится Нордос. В этот, мало того, что скрыли, так вы еще, именно а вы, как вы? депутат Государственной Думы, вы? обвинили, что я эти планы не должен был предавать населению. Кому я разгласил? Я разгласил полковнику ФСБ, действующему, который предупреждал о том, что могут вот эти быть смерти. Они были, они ваши, кровь на вас. Если мы не будем на это реагировать, это ну, дорога в никуда. Мы себя обрекаем на будущие проблемы, связанные с этими ужасными организациями. Поэтому реагировать надо, бороться надо. И это должны делать все, не только Россия. Это должна делать и Америка. Это должны делать страны Европы. Все вместе душить в зародыше вот эти вот негативные явления. Коррупция в правоохранительных органах и спецслужбах России – это не частные факты отдельных лиц, которые пытаются заработать незаконно деньги, а это система, которая идет из кабинета президента Российской Федерации. До 97 -го года я там служил. В 97-м году меня, перевели, меня и несколько моих сослуживцев перевели в самое секретное подразделение ФСБ, которое занималось, как мы, мы потом уже поняли, когда нам начали ставить эти задачи, которое занималось несудебными расправами. То есть задача была подразделение по заданию высших должностных лиц страны убирать неугодно. A wave of bloody explosions swept through Russian cities. On the 4th of September, in Bunaksk, in Dagestan, 62 people died in the rubble of a tower block. On the night of the 9th of September, in Moscow, an eight-story apartment building in Gurianov Street was blown to bits. A toll of 94 dead and 164 wounded. At dawn, on the 13th of September, in the capital city again, a powerful explosion totally destroyed a seven-story building on the Kashira Road. 119 bodies were pulled from the rubble. They included 12 children. Three days later, in Volgodonsk in southern Russia, 17 people died in another explosion. Russia had never before been subjected to such acts of terrorism. Mass psychosis quickly set in. All offices and non-residential premises, cellars and basements were thoroughly checked. Civilians volunteered to patrol courtyards, stairways and landings. A multitude of checkpoints paralyzed road transport. Responsibility for the attacks has never been claimed, but from day one, the secret services put the blame squarely on the Chechens. The people who organize these missions, who prepare the explosives, who deliver them, and have overall responsibility for everything that has happened are obviously in Chechnya. I can tell you with the utmost certainty, I can guarantee you that they come from the training camps of Khatab and Basayev. After a three-year truce in Chechnya, the war had now moved to the heart of Russia. With public anger running so high, the Prime Minister Vladimir Putin ordered a bombing campaign to bring the rebellious Chechens to heel. Russian planes are only striking the terrorist bases. We will follow the terrorists wherever they go. If they are at the airport, we will be there. Excuse me, but if they're in the toilets, we will go in there and blow them away. That's all there is to it. The problem is solved. When the first explosions took place in Moscow, then in Volgodonsk, the public was in a state of stupefaction and shock. 
This coincided with the appointment of Putin as Prime Minister. And I think that then about 90 to 95 percent of people, just like today in America, supported the action the president was taking to eliminate the Chechen bans. But what's interesting is that even now it hasn't been proved that the Chechens did it. OK, so the finger is pointing at a whole people, the Chechens. But show me who carried out the attack, show me who planted the bombs. They can't do it. The slow progress of the inquiries, the absence of proof, the sheer scale and professionalism of the bombings all cast doubt on Chechen involvement. Speculation as to the possible involvement of the Lubyanka, the secret services, began to emerge. To judge from the consequences, and they say that in politics you should always look to see who benefits, then of course there are all sorts of different versions. But the public is still very interested in the role played by the special services in all of this. After public demands for peace, the enraged Russian people turned against the Chechens and the war was renewed. There's little doubt that it was the toughened public opinion that put the young hardliner Vladimir Putin, the former head of the secret service, the FSB, into the Kremlin. To this day, the only terrorists detected in connection with the bombings were FSB agents. The first suspicions of special service involvement in the bombings came after three explosions had already claimed more than 300 lives. It was then, on the 22nd of September 1999, that a bomb attack was apparently averted in Ryazan. It was officially passed off as a civil defense exercise, using a mock-up device. But many Russians believe the bomb was real. To them, President Putin's rise to power is now seen in a very different light. Those involved in investigating the mysterious events in Ryazan include journalists from Novaya Gazeta, one of Moscow's last remaining independent publications. And since the FSB doesn't like it when people pry, the newspaper has had more than its fair share of problems. We consider that, according to the law, according to the Russian penal code as it stands, the facts disclosed by our paper should lead to the opening of a criminal inquiry to establish if those facts are indeed well founded. But instead of that, a slander suit has been brought against the paper. In August 2001, Novaya Gazeta took a risk when it published extracts from a book by Yuri Felstinsky and Alexander Litvinenko, The FSB Bombs Russia. The historian Yuri Felstinsky was born in Moscow and since 1978 has lived and worked in the United States. He has written several books on the history of the USSR. An American citizen, he was the first foreigner to obtain a Russian doctorate in history. We all know that information often comes out after failed operations. That's what's happened here. The FSB tried and failed to blow up a building in Ryazan. The details are clear enough now to make it a textbook case. We know everything. What car they came in, how many of them there were, when and how they planted the bomb. We even know what time it should have gone off. And it can hardly be a coincidence that these attacks stopped after the bungling of Ryazan. It would have been stupid to carry on with a flawed battle plan. 
The NTV television channel, then still independent, took an interest in the Ryazan case. In March 2000, it broadcast an open debate with everyone involved in the affair in its show, Independent Inquiry. Thanks to these images, which strangely enough have neither been seized nor destroyed, we can reconstruct what really happened in Ryazan. On the 22nd of September, at 10 past 9 in the evening, a suspicious scene was played out in front of an apartment building. Two men and a woman unloaded three large bags from the boot of a white car and carried them into a basement. A second suspicious point was that the number 62, indicating a Ryazan vehicle registration, was written on a piece of card and taped over the car's real number. It's polonium. It's a million times a lethal dose. He's dead. No, he's 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 not he's not dead. He's he's very poorly, but he's still alive. No Clive, he's dead. Nine o'clock on the evening of the twenty third, he suffered a further cardiac arrest. Слушайте, обратитесь к голливудским фильмам и к вашим фильмам про Джеймса Бонда. Вы же сами там такого порой напридумываете. Ну вот и покопайтесь внутри себя, уважаемые британцы. In December 2007, Lugovoy became a member of Russia's parliament, giving him immunity from prosecution. The Home Secretary, Theresa May, ruled out a public inquiry, fearing it would damage relations with Russia. But finally, in 2014, under pressure from the High Court, she changed her mind. More than eight years after Litvinenko's death, the public inquiry opened at the High Court in London. For me, it was already like, I've done it. I'm already satisfied. Because it was very important to bring information to public. Lugovoy and Cobton poisoned him. And you will decide on all of the evidence whether or not they were sponsored by the Russian state. Some people started to say, mm, we're not sure they're going to do anything against Russia. And they said they probably will just close this case. I'm not going to do anything. Finally, Judge Sir Robert Owen delivered his verdict. I have concluded that there is a strong probability that when Mr. Lugovoy poisoned Mr. Lepnenko, he did so under the direction of the FSB. I have further concluded that the FSB operation to kill Mr. Litvinenko was probably approved by Mr. Petruchev, then head of the FSB, and also by President Putin. В лондонском до сих пор непонятно, что произошло. Понятно, что умер он от. The two individuals named by the police and CPS are officers from the Russian military intelligence service. Today's announcement marks the most significant development in this investigation. We now have sufficient evidence to bring charges in relation to the attack on Sergei and Yulia Skripal in Salisbury. If either man travels to a country where the EAW is valid, 
They will be arrested and face extradition on these charges. We will not tolerate such barbaric attacks against our country. It's early March 2018 and the quiet Wiltshire city of Salisbury, famous for its cathedral spire and medieval past, is about to become the centre of the world. Two people, a man and a woman, are found unconscious on a bench in the city centre. Within hours, the older man's identity is revealed. He is Sergei Skripal, a former Russian intelligence officer for the infamous GRU, who worked as a double agent for Britain's MI6 during the 1990s. The younger woman, found slumped next to him, is his daughter Yulia, visiting her father from Moscow. They are both rushed to the local hospital. As you know, these two people remain critically ill in hospital. Sadly, in addition, a police officer, who was one of the first to attend the scene and respond to the incident, is now also in a serious condition in hospital. Skripal had come to the UK in 2010 as part of a prisoner swap deal negotiated between Moscow and Washington. For years, he'd lived a quiet, anonymous life in rural southwest England, but now his past had caught up with him. He is a very nice gentleman, very polite, and whenever I see I'm really happy to serve him. Samples are taken from the victims and sent to the Ministry of Defence's Science and Technology Laboratories, better known as Porton Down. It's just nine miles down the road from Salisbury. Its proximity feeds growing conspiracy theories emanating from Russia and her allies. Within days, the scientists have a result. Sergei and Yulia Skripal have been poisoned by Novichok, a military-grade nerve agent invented and manufactured by the Soviet Union. 250 specialist counter-terrorism officers are assigned to the investigation and the military is called in to help. They must wade through thousands of hours of CCTV footage and sweep an entire city searching for any small trace of this deadly nerve agent. In Brussels, the Prime Minister and her National Security Advisor set out Britain's case to NATO and EU allies. Russia staged a brazen and reckless attack against the United Kingdom when it attempted the murder of two people on the streets of Salisbury. I'll be raising this issue with my counterparts today because it's clear that the Russian threat does not respect orders. And indeed, the incident in Salisbury was part of a pattern of Russian aggression against Europe and its near neighbours uh, from the Western Balkans to the Middle East. In New York, Britain's ambassador to the United Nations clashes with her Russian counterpart in the Security Council chamber. If I may say so, Mr. President, I won't take any lectures on morality or on our responsibilities under such international conventions from a country that, as this council debated yesterday, has done so much to block the proper investigation of the use of chemical weapons in Syria. And in London, Moscow's ambassador holds a series of televised press conferences, repeatedly questioning UK intelligence and suggesting competing theories of his own. We get the impression that the British government is deliberately pursuing the policy of destroying all possible evidence, classifying all remaining materials and making an independent and transparent investigation impossible. Behind the scenes, the UK intelligence agencies have been working hard to convince their partners that Russia was behind the attack. It pays off. On the 27th of March, in a coordinated wave of global action, 25 countries expel 142 Russian diplomats in an act of solidarity with Britain. It is the largest mass expulsion of diplomats in history and a considerable victory for Theresa May's government. Against the odds, Sergei and Yulia Skripal recover and are discharged from hospital in Salisbury. They are taken into hiding, but Yulia records a statement from an undisclosed location. It is the first, and to date the only time, that we have heard from either of them. In the longer term, I hope to return home to my own country. I wish to address a couple of issues directly and have chosen to interrupt my rehabilitation to make this short statement. 
I ask that everyone respects the privacy of me and my father. We need time to recover and come to terms with everything that has happened. I'm grateful for the offers of assistance from the Russian embassy, but at the moment, I do not wish to avail myself of their services. For weeks, the case goes quiet until a dramatic and sad twist. Two local residents named as Dawn Sturgis and Charlie Rowley are found foaming from the mouth at a flat in the nearby town of Amesbury. Tests confirm that they too have been poisoned by Novichok. The hunt is on to establish where and how they came into contact with the nerve agent and whether the city of Salisbury is still at risk. It will later come out that Charlie Rowley found a discarded perfume bottle and gave it to his girlfriend. At last, the police have the weapon. On Saturday the 8th of July, only a week after she was rushed to hospital, Dawn Sturgis dies. Scotland Yard escalates its investigation. As you are all now sadly aware, we have launched a murder investigation after learning the devastating news that Dawn Sturgis died in hospital last night at 26 minutes past eight. It is both shocking and utterly appalling that a British citizen has died having been exposed to a Novichok nerve agent. Over the summer, the investigation continued, but little new information came out until yesterday. Almost exactly six months after the attack on the Scripples, the Metropolitan Police got a small group of journalists into a locked briefing room and for an hour revealed detailed information that they had gathered, the most significant developments of the investigation so far. CCTV images, a timeline, and most importantly, for the first time, the identity of the two Russian suspects believed to have been behind the poisoning. Scotland Yard named them as Alexander Petrov and Ruslan Bosharov. Both men travelled on Russian passports. Both names are believed to be aliases. In the House of Commons, the Prime Minister went further. The government has concluded that the two individuals named by the police and CPS are officers from the Russian Military Intelligence Service, also known as the GRU. So this was not a rogue operation. We will not tolerate such barbaric attacks against our country. And together with our allies, this government will continue to do whatever is necessary to keep our people safe. At 3 p.m. on Friday the 2nd of March, Alexander Petrov and Ruslan Bosharov arrived at Gatwick Airport on Aeroflot flight SU-2588 from Moscow. The suspects travelled by train in central London, first to Victoria Station, then crossing town to Waterloo. That night, they slept at the City Stay Hotel on Bow Road in East London. The next morning, the pair took the tube back to Waterloo and caught a train to Salisbury. Police believe that this was a two-hour reconnaissance trip carried out at the same time, coincidentally, as Yulia Skripal, Sergei's daughter, arrived in the UK from Moscow. By that time, though, Petrov and Bosharov were back on the train to London, arriving at their hotel on Bow Road at five past eight. On the morning of the attempted assassination, the two suspects made their way once again to Waterloo Station, arriving at five past eight and boarding a train carrying a counterfeit bottle of Nina Ritchie perfume filled with the deadly nerve agent, Novichok. They arrived in Salisbury at 11.48. 10 minutes later, they were caught on CCTV around the corner from Sergei Skripal's house. Having done a recce the day before, the two suspects would have known exactly what they had to do when they got here. But they have entered a CCTV black hole. There is no camera coverage of this close, and that has made the investigation much harder. The pair were filmed again just after one o'clock on Fisherton Road, close to the station. We know that Sergei Skripal's car was seen driving from Devizes Road to the town centre at 1.30 in the afternoon, parking at the upper level of the Malton Shopping Centre car park at 1.40. We don't know whether he and his daughter were at home or whether they were out at the time that the Novichok was applied. But the exposure to the deadly nerve agent must have taken place sometime between 12 and 1.30, because the two Russian suspects left Salisbury just before 2 o'clock in the afternoon. 
A short time later, the Scripples moved from the Mill pub where they'd gone for a drink and they went to have lunch at Zizi's Italian restaurant. They left there at 35 minutes past three in the afternoon. CCTV footage shows them shortly after that on Market Walk, just before they were found collapsed on a park bench nearby. As emergency services down in Salisbury were responding to the Scripples, the two Russians, Petrov and Bosharov, had arrived back in London. They made their way immediately to Heathrow Airport, passing through passport control at 7.30 in the evening. They boarded Aeroflot flight SU-2585, which took off for Moscow at 10.30 p.m., just nine hours after the pair had carried out their deadly attack. This is a sophisticated attack, you know, taking place across borders from one country to another. It seems highly unlikely that anyone who would have come here planning an assassination would have done so in their real names. Um, we have intelligence, we have good lines of inquiry um, to try and establish who they are, but I need the evidence. I need somebody to come forward and give me their real names. We now have the names and photos of the two key suspects and a timeline of their movements. The story is being slowly pieced together and Britain's key allies say they believe it. But how much, if anything, did President Putin know about this assassination attempt? Did it go to the very top of the Russian government? I think he certainly allows the GRU and other aspects of his intelligence network to take decisions that, in his view, will punish people who have betrayed the Russian Federation. So whether he knew about the specific operation or whether it was just who will rid me of this turbulent priest sort of stuff, I don't think it matters. Unless the Russian government hands Alexander Petrov and Ruslan Bashirov over, it is unlikely they will ever face justice. But their operation in late March on the streets of a quiet cathedral city has had profound global consequences that will last years. Мы на самом деле те, кого и показывали. Руслан Баширов. Александр Петров. Это ваши настоящие имена? Да. Да, это наши настоящие имена. Ну вы даже сейчас, когда об этом говорите, вы вот честно выглядите очень напряженными. А как бы вы, как бы вы выглядели когда после всего? Когда вашу жизнь так вот раз и перевернули с ног на голову? Просто одним днем и сломали. На этих записях, которые мы видим из Лондона, где вы ходите в этих уже знаменитых пуховиках, кроссовочках, по Солсбери, это вы? Да. Да, это мы. Что вы там делали? Ну, друзья нам давно уже советовали посетить этот прекрасный город. Солсбери? Да. Прекрасный город? Да. Он ну, это а туристический он город. Там есть знаменитая, знаменитый собор, Салберецкий собор. Он знаменит не только во всей Европе, он знаменит, я так думаю, даже во всем мире. Он знаменит своим шпилем 123-метровым, он знаменит своими часами, самыми первыми часами, которые были изобретены в мире, которые до сих пор идут. То есть Вообще... вы, вы поехали в Солсбери посмотреть на часы? Да нет, но с самого, начала, с самого начала мы планировали приехать в Лондон и оторваться, грубо говоря. Это была не бизнес-поездка сейчас. И мы распланировали так, что мы и в Лондоне побываем, и съездим в Солсбери. Естественно, это все должно было быть одним днем. Но когда мы туда прилетели...